Hi guys, today we have got Nick Letter and the talk is A Trip to Earth Science with Python as a Companion. Hello everyone, uh, obviously my name is Nick Letter. Um, I am a PhD student here at Cardiff University. I am in the Department of Mathematics and I consider myself to be an applied mathematician. Uh, but today I'm not going to talk to you about maths, I'm actually going to talk to you about a trick that I recently took. So, for those who, I, uh, there are some familiar faces in the crowd, but for those who don't know me, I'm sure at this point you realize that I have an accent. And it came to a surprise to myself as well. I watched a video of one of my previous talks a few days ago, I was like, oh. So, would you like to take a guess where I am from? And you cannot offend me, so please, <laughs> go for me. Greece? Yes, this, that was fast. I had a few hints here, uh, just in case. Um, we get in place. So yes, I am from Greece and I am going somewhere um, with this. I come from Kos Island, which is located here. Kos is quite famous for various reasons. Uh, me being from there is not one of them. Um, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, was originally from Kos. Uh, Kos is one of the Greek islands that really accepted tourism, uh, so a lot of people, uh, especially from Britain, go there during the summer for holidays. Uh, in 2015, alongside Mytilini, it was the two islands that were affected by the immigration waves coming mainly from Syria. And in 2017, the island was uh, hit by an earthquake. So these um, are pictures from the city center. I live quite close to this. Uh, this is where my sister's husband worked. So a lot of people were affected, uh, 100 people were injured, uh, some people lost their jobs, their houses, and unfortunately <coughs> two people lost their lives. But that was just a natural disaster, right? Nobody could predict it. Um, and I went home um, a few days after the earthquake happened. Everybody was feeling a bit of terror. Uh, my family was a bit shaken. Um, but I, I did not have that feeling, right? Because I was not there during the event. But what I actually felt was interest. Something has happened to my island, it has affected the life of my people, of my family, and I knew nothing about it. How earthquakes happen? Uh, is there another earthquake going to happen soon? <coughs> Could we predict it? Could we help somehow? And so here I am, uh, 40 degrees in summer, summer, we're sitting on a big spot, and I see that the deadline for Python is up. And I'm like, oh, what would I like to talk about? And the only thing that kept coming to my mind was about earthquakes. So that's when I decided to go on a trip. So now on my trip, I need two things. And the first thing that I need is a dolphin. The dolphin is just the thing that is going to get me there. And for that, I chose open research, because there's a lot of knowledge available and it's free. But the second thing that I need in order for this trip to be easier, uh, to be fun, I need a companion. And I was thinking, like, what can I do? Uh, what, what should my companion be to make the weight of the journey just slightly easier? And that's when I decided that something was going to be fine. So the first thing that we need to talk about is what are earthquakes? How do earthquakes occur? So imagine that this is the Earth. The outer plane of uh, the Earth that's underneath our continents and the oceans is called the crust. So the crust is not uh, one piece that surrounds the Earth. Actually think about it as puzzles. So we have these little puzzle pieces that are really close to each other and they make up the crust. So now let's cut Earth in half. What we have is the inner core and the outer core. And here it's very warm, so we don't go there. Then we have the mantle, and the mantle makes up 84% of our Earth, of our planet. So the mantle is between the cores and the crust. And the mantle thing about it is a viscous fluid. And if you know what that is, think about the American cheese that comes out of the can and think that you have two crackers and you put it on top of that cheese. That are, these are puzzle pieces. And these puzzle pieces are called uh, tectonic plates. So now puzzle pieces that are on top of the mantle, they slightly move, go right and left. But sometimes they get stuck. And when they get stuck, there's pressure building. And but that pressure needs to be released. And when that pressure is released, that's when seismic waves happen, and that's why the Earth shakes. And that's how earthquakes occur. I know it sounds a bit horrible, I mean, like, oh, we have these plates and they're moving, they could be moving right now and they get stuck. Sounds weird, but actually not. It happens a lot. It happens, uh, more than 100 earthquakes approximately happen every month. 
So when I was reading and I, and I saw that, I was like, the first thing that came to my mind as an applied mathematician was like, oh, that's a lot of uh, data that I can get my hands on. So the first thing that I did was look at Python libraries. And the first <coughs> one that came up was a library called QuakeFit. So QuakeFit allows you to collect data from the UCGS. And the UCGS is the United States Geological Survey. You can collect data and uh, for, um, for the 30 past days, you can't get uh, you can't get more data behind that. And uh, all you have to do is specify the period that you want. You can get month, week, or daily, and you have to specify the magnitude. So, what is a magnitude? Was the second the second question that popped into my head. So, a magnitude is the number that we use to characterize a earthquake. And what is the magnitude actually is um, measured, it's measured on is, uh, have you seen those little needles? We call them uh, seismographs. You usually see them in movies. I think there was one in the old Superman when he broke the earth and he was shaking. Um, so these machines are all over the world and they keep recording and they very, um, when, when the earth shakes, they start recording because they're very, um, very easy. They're, they're very easy. Um, easy. Sensitive, thank you very much. They're very sensitive. So the magnitude um, has categories, and depending on the size of the earthquake, we characterize that earthquake. The one that came, we came the uh, my Island was a 6.7, so it was a strong earthquake. So I can use QuakeSpeed to collect some data. That's what one instance of the data looks like. Um, no explaining, you can read all of it, uh, but what you can see on the top are the coordinates, and the coordinates are in the system of um, latitude and longitude, which is um, a unit measure for geograph geographical uh, locations. And so I approximately now know the latitude and the longitude of my island, which I did not before, because this instance actually is for an earthquake that happened on COS a few days ago with a magnitude of 4.4. The data also return you if a tsunami happened, no, um, the type, it was an earthquake, and many other data you can play around with. Are there any other libraries that like to do the same? Yes, uh, there's also earthquakes. Um, earthquakes has a very similar, so it's collecting data from the exact same uh, place, from the UCGS. The syntax is quite similar. Uh, the default values are the past, uh, collect all the uh, earthquakes that happened in the past hour. But again, you can specify for one week, month, and the magnitude that you want. Uh, differences between those two libraries. Um, I like QuakeFeeds because uh, I thought the documentation was easier for me to follow. Um, but Earthquakes is implemented also in Java. And it had a really good tutorial, uh, what if I want to keep collecting data? Right, because you can get up to 30 days ago. So let's say that I, you, know, you can write a script and you can every month you can ping the API and keep collecting data. So now that we have this database, what do we do with it? So going back to QuakeSpeed, uh, it actually allows you very nicely with a building function to create a Google Map. And this is what it looks like. So I have my database, I just run the command and it, and it gives me this file, which is actually a Google Map. I can zoom in, I can zoom out. So if I zoom in Greece, I know where Greece is. <laughs> so if I zoom in case, and I can also place my little human here, and I'm not sure where I'm going to end up. I ended up on the beach. So, um, so Quakespeed allows you to do this, uh, but the next question was like, what if I wanted something I could easily manipulate? Right? What if I wanted to, let's say, have a map and show hourly data where earthquakes happen, something like that? <coughs> so. <coughs> That's when I found another tool that I can use in Python, and it's called MapReduce Based Map Toolkit. Uh, this is a tutorial. Uh, it's very good. I follow this tutorial to learn everything I have so far, and it's actually quite straightforward to use. Um, here, I can draw the Earth, which I'm sure this is a better picture than the one that I used on my third slide. Um, all I have to do is just say I want the projection to be ortho. That stands for orthographic. Um, I want the latitude and the, you give two, um, you give a latitude and a longitude, and I, <coughs> I try to get uh, Europe, and I want the resolution to be high. So you get this, which again is not very accurate. So can we add to it? 
Yes, we can. We can, again, very easily, just a few lines of code. We can get the meridians, we can get the parallels, uh, we can get the countries, and we can add some color. Maybe we'll open it. Um, so this is the orthographic projection. Um, it looks like the sphere, and the lines give you an illusion of depth. It has advantages and disadvantages, of course. Uh, it looks more like um, the shape of the actual Earth. Uh, the distances and between the countries and the size of the countries are more accurate than other projections. Um, but are there different projections, and are, are they implemented? Yes, they are. Uh, this is the projection called Robinson. Um, the idea behind Robinson projection was we want a projection we can look at the uh, at Earth, the entire Earth, on your, you know, on one map, and that's uh, this was created. Uh, disadvantages: um, if you, the closer you go to the poles, the uh, sizes are affected. So uh, this should be way smaller than it actually is. Uh, but again, for each use that you want, you want you can change between projections. Um, quite interesting. The disadvantage of a sphere is that you cannot hang it on your wall. So now that I dropped the world map, what do I want? Right now, I don't care about the world, right? I care about my island. So I want to zoom into my island, and I do. All I have to do is specify two uh, points, the um, lower where you see it, left and the upper right, and I zoom in, and I get Greece. So it's not a very accurate map of Greece, and I don't know if you can tell, but um, my island is not here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a bit offended at this point, but it's fine, right? Why is it fine? Because I have a data set, and these data in their data set, I have some um, data on earthquakes that happen close to my island at least. So what if I can plot those points there? And I can't. And that's approximately where my island should be. And that's why base map uh, works nicely with uh, seismographic data. But I told you that, you pay attention, but I told you that the big earthquake happened in July. And it was a strong one because it, was, it had a magnitude of 6.7. But then when I was looking at my data, I showed you another earthquake that happened that had a magnitude of 4.4. So does that mean that earthquakes are still shaking my island? And the answer is yes. So in order to... Um, look at the uh, notion of how earthquakes happen. I collected some data from the current, uh, from a very recent uh, earthquake that happened in Mexico, which was way stronger, and unfortunately a lot of people lost their lives. Uh, but because it was quite recent, I can collect a lot of data. So the way earthquakes happen, there are three periods. There's a period before the main shock, where the main shock is the big, is the strongest earthquake that happens during that event. We have the foreshock period, so is when before the peak, and after, everything after that <coughs> is the aftershock. So my island actually, right now, is in that period of the aftershocks. Uh, geologists, and uh, I found this very interesting as a applied mathematician, they look at historical data to tell you, to try to understand when the main shock happened, when the foreshock is happening, and when the main shock is happening. Uh, because again, it's Earth, right? It's nature, we cannot say for sure, uh, we cannot predict for sure what will happen tomorrow. So I found this very interesting, uh, these periods and the fact that they look historical data in a very similar way than I do for different reasons. Um, so moving on, uh, one other thing I would like to say is, I have all this data, I can draw the world map, what can I do? I can actually plot all the earthquakes that happened over the past month. So this is just data for one month. Um, you can see we have three different colors. Um, mainly uh, the red ones indicate a bigger, a strong earthquake and, and more, a great. And you can see that we have smaller there, so that means that could be the foreshock or the may, or the aftershock period, which I thought was really nice. You can see that there are many happening here and on the coast of America, and that is because there are two, um, there are where two tectonic plates mix. So at this point, of course, uh, where the our puzzle pieces meet. Uh, it's more easily uh, earthquakes happen at that point. Um, something I forgot to mention was why aftershock happens. So imagine that you are <coughs> late and something pushes you out of your place. And you're feeling a bit uncomfortable and you just want to go back. And that is what the plates are doing. Once they move after the, the pressure being released, they want to go back to their place and be comfortable. So that's one way you can play around with uh, geological data and the uh, tumor. Baseball. 
Um, the last thing that I would like to mention is a library called OSPI that I do not have a lot of time to play around with. Uh, but what OSPI allows you to do, and it has a really, it has a really good documentation and it looks uh, well written, uh, is analyze the seismographs. The seismographs that we get the magnitude out. Um, it allows you to collect the data, analyze them, change the colors. Um, so that's definitely one tool I would like to look upon if I continue that journey, this journey in earth science. These are all the libraries that I spoke about today. And as a summary, uh, I'm not here now to show myself as an expert in earth science. I'm sure there might be stuff that I didn't take, uh, didn't get exactly right. So please, if you know a science, find me later. Um, and I'm definitely not here because I want to change my field. I'm happy in mathematics for now. So what I'm here to talk to you about is sometimes things happen in our life. Uh, it could be a natural disaster, it can be something smaller. Um, and we get that interest of the things that we don't re know and we really, really realize that we don't have knowledge on everything. And that's when we start reading or looking up resources to understand something. But that can be quite boring, right? Reading just article papers or watching YouTube videos can be boring. And that's what Python did for me, made this entire experience very interesting. And I could somehow look at a field that I had no idea, very close to something that was looking at data, analyzing the data, and looking at the historical data, which is very close to what I actually do in my everyday life. And that's all I have to say today. Um, thank you. with the maps so the two things that come into mind first of all I use libraries that were already implemented to ping the API so one thing would be to create my own tool that I can ping these APIs and the second would be maybe keep collecting data and plot uh, daily or uh, monthly onto the big map just out of fun and make a gif out of it yes So I did not look at other um, natural disasters or other phenomena. Uh, I just looked for earthquakes, and so my answer will be uh, all I know is about these data, and I, I could only get for 30 days. I, I could get uh, maybe for an event that happened many years ago, 1994 or something like that, uh, but that's all the knowledge I have on the data. Sorry. Uh, do you think you might be able to use the <coughs> to sort of make predictions about future quakes? Or? So, um, Again, looking at the historical, if I had, um, if, if the event in my island finished, I could compare it with other older um, earthquakes that happened. Um, so just look just at the timeline and see what they look. So that is one really good question. And I think uh, people in, in the geological department do try to predict, but in the end of the day, you can't be very, very sure. But uh, I would love to do that if I had more data in my hands. So what was, the, what was the greatest challenge you faced while you were doing this journey? Um, uh, Mainly understand um, a lot of geological concepts. Again, I don't think I got everything absolutely right, uh, but even the magnitude, um, it has an, looking at the seismographs, and that's why I didn't go too much into details about OSPI. It has a science behind it, right? Yeah. Uh, to remove the variations and do all this stuff. I think that was a challenge for me, and that's when I realized I need to put even more effort than I'm already doing into this. And, I'm not sure if I'm going to do that yet. Um, thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much.